principal character in your book is Ilya Selvinsky, a Jewish Soviet poet who is not very well known in the West. Who was he? And why is it important to bring his name to light now? Ilya Selvinsky, as you point out correctly, is not exactly a household name in uh, the Western world, even though his works have been appearing in translation, in English translation, since the 1930s. Uh, and he certainly is not as well known as some of the key figures of Russian poetry, such as Anna Akhmatova, Osip Ndrishtam, or Boris Pusternak, are well known in translation, or to take some key Jewish uh, authors from the Soviet Union, Isaac Babel, uh, uh, from the 1920s and 30s, or to take the writers whose name is particularly well known in connection with the Shoah, the Holocaust, Vasily Grossman or Ilya Ehrenburg. And yet, Ilya Sivinsky is a principal figure in uh, Soviet literature and culture, and a major uh, presence in Jewish uh, literature as well. His name is first and foremost associated in Russian culture with uh, the early Soviet avant-garde poetry and drama. He was uh, the principal member of uh, the uh, Center of Literary Constructivists, which was an early avant-garde Soviet movement that was by the late 1920s repressed, suppressed, as uh, uh, the other avant-garde, relatively independent movements had. He was also a major playwright, so much so that Mir Holt, the visionary director, admired him and staged his work. Uh, but in the story that I'm telling in the book, Ilya Silminsky is first and foremost a early and major literary witness to the Shoah in the occupied Soviet territories. That's the story that I focus on, and that's the contribution that I am highlighting in the book. What exactly did Silvinsky witness in January of 1942, and why was his reportage so important? To answer the question about what Silvinsky witnessed in January 1942, we need to go back a little bit to the uh, beginning of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union and to the history of the Shoah, the Holocaust, in the occupied territories. I say this because, uh, of course, the world is very well aware today of the industrialized murder of Jews in the death camps, uh, in Poland, in the Nazi uh, extermination camps. However, to this day, uh, there is much less general awareness of the fact that the Shoah became the Shoah in the weeks and months following the broad Nazi advances in the summer of 1941. It was during uh, the summer and fall of 1941 that thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, depending on the size of the community and territory that was occupied, of Jews were murdered in a low-tech way by bullet, the Shoah by bullet, we say today, in uh, that br wide, swath of Soviet territories from the Baltics, uh, from the Baltic Sea in the north all the way down to the Black Sea. And it's here that the occupation of Crimea that uh, enters my story. Basically, what we should know is that uh, the Crimean Peninsula, as you remember, this is a large peninsula that kind of juts out from the south of Russia into the Black Sea. So if you then sail off from Sebastopol, you'll end up in Turkey. Uh, there was a great deal militarily at stake in the Crimea. If you control the Crimea, you basically control access to the Caucasus to the oil fields, and the fighting was extremely severe. Uh, and by uh, the, the, the Nazis initially occupied the entire Crimean Peninsula, moving from the north uh, to the south and to the east. Uh, the Crimea had a large pre-war Jewish population, and it also prided itself on uh, some Jewish autonomous regions, Jewish collective farms. Basically, between 30 and 40,000 Jews were murdered uh, in uh, Crimea. Uh, Silvinsky was originally from Crimea. That was his native territory, his homeland. Uh, in the uh, early weeks of the war, he volunteered, and for reasons that have to do with the fact that he had fallen into quite a bit of disfavor before the war, there were a number of party resolutions targeting him. Uh, he 
was not assigned to a more prestigious position. He was sent off as a regular military journalist to the 51st Separate Army that was defending the, uh, his native Crimea. So he was in Crimea from the very beginning of the invasion. And the murder of Jews in Crimea was carried out by units of Einsatzgruppe D, commanded by the famous Dr. Ollendorf, a highly educated man, an economist, and uh, an arch murderer who carried out the uh, orders to make Crimea Juden Rhine, uh, free of Jews, uh, exactly as the orders were made. Uh, the units of uh, Einsatzgruppe uh, D, aided by regular Wehrmacht troops and the local collaborators, were carrying out the murders in the towns and cities of Crimea. And the way they were carried out was usually Jews were rounded up, taken to the outskirts of a Crimean city, and murdered either over an anti-tank ditch or some natural uh, depression or ravine, or yar, as it's called in uh, Russian. Uh, which brings us to the easternmost part of Crimea, the so-called Kerch Peninsula. Basically, this is the eastern tip of the uh, Crimea. And so, as you can imagine, the Soviet troops were retreating there, and the civilians were being evacuated there. There was a certain bottleneck effect. When the Soviet troops uh, originally left the Crimea, uh, and Sidminsky was with them, uh, of course the civilians remained. Many of them had not been able to, uh, to be evacuated. And so the Jews of Kerch uh, were rounded up in late November, early December of 1941. They were originally kept in a city jail. Uh, women and young uh, uh, and teenage girls were raped en masse, their bodies were disfigured, and then the survivors were trucked to an anti-tank ditch just west of the city and murdered there in the course of several days in early December. Uh, a number of thousand, the number is still being debated, but uh, between five and 10,000 is the, the numbers that we hear, and I don't have time to get into this, but uh, the point of this, uh, uh, women, children, elderly, uh, uh, Crimean Jews and evacuated Jews were murdered there, uh, and then something really remarkable happens in the history of the Holocaust and how it was documented. At the very end of December 1941, the Soviets carry out a very ambitious operation uh, whereby they take over the eastern part of the Crimean Peninsula. And so basically, Silvinsky, as a military journalist, as a political officer, arrives in, back in that area where the murders had taken place, some of them as early as a week prior to his arrival, and he soon finds himself in the beginning of January 1942 going to that anti-tank ditch, which is filled to the brim with bodies of uh, then the recently executed Jews. If you can imagine, this was the first or early documented Holocaust evidence that was documented amply that was photographed, filmed, and was written about. And the person who got to tell the story in writing was the poet Ilya Silvinsky. And what is particularly remarkable is that as early as the second half of January and early February 1942, he publishes a long poem called I Saw It, which is the title of my book, which it tells in detail about what he witnessed, what he saw at that execution site. The poem is printed in mainstream Soviet newspapers and literary magazines, reprinted a number of times throughout 1942, which means that Silvinsky becomes the first national poetic witness to the Nazi atrocities, the first Jewish poet to witness the Shoah. And just to add one more thing so you can understand this, and there are some of the photographs that have uh, survived uh, to this day of what these early witnesses saw. It was absolutely shocking because they, even in their wildest dreams, could not imagine this enormous open air morgue. It was about just above freezing temperature. So the, imagine these thousands of people, children, women with infants were murdered and then a week later, the bodies still lie there. They're not decomposing. They're slightly frozen, like in this large open air morgue. So you see real people. Why is this important? Because when the Soviet troops begin to liberate the occupied territories in the summer and fall 1943, say Kiev is taken, uh, when they come to Babiar, they do not see 
people who look like people. And then when, of course, some of the death camps are being liberated, what you often see is pulverized bones or ashes or nothing at all. These look like real people. And he writes about them with such power that there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that, you know, in the history of documenting the, the Shoah and in the history of Holocaust literature, this is the first major statement. You argue that Silvinsky and other Jewish poets paid a great price for bearing witness to the Shoah. Could you summarize your argument? The question of the price that uh, early Holocaust witnesses, specifically Jewish-Russian poets like Silvinsky or Antakolsky uh, or Irinburg, who were the first to both write and publish about the Shoah in the Soviet mainstream, this question really interests me very much, uh, both as a historical question, as a political ideological question, and uh, uh, as a philosophical question, uh, the price of bearing witness, the price of witnessing. Uh, to answer this question, uh, one needs to say one thing first, and that is that from the very beginning, and the beginning really is the story that I tell in the book. So uh, the earliest documented evidence from the Shoah is January 1941, the Crimean Peninsula, the Kiersch Peninsula, Kiersch. From the very beginning, Stalin's regime was not sure how to report the Shoah and what to do with those uh, victims of the genocide uh, with Jews. And already by the spring of 1941, we see the emergence of a unwritten doctrine that was already very much enforced uh, after the Stalingrad battle, and so early 1943. Uh, but even in 42, we see it. The doctrine of, the so-called doctrine of not dividing the victims which meant that if you saw 5,000 murdered Jews, you weren't allowed to say these were Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. What you were encouraged, expected, and subsequently required to say is these were peaceful Soviet civilians, right? So the Jews are being taken out of the Holocaust, which is not only, uh, of course, you know, in and of itself an act of uh, as another act of violence against Jewish memory, but also an absurdity from the historical point of view. And yet, that's the situation in which early Soviet witnesses to the Shoah find themselves, which is why I say, which is why I argue, that what Silvinsky does in 1942 is an act of uh, tremendous courage as a citizen and an act of Jewish zealotry. In other words, he manages to find a way to come up with a rhetoric whereby he reports what he saw and still identifies the victims as both Soviets and as Jews. In the poem I saw it, the word Jew appears twice, and that is unthinkable in the context of what the Soviet press was reporting, because there was regular journalists who were sent to report these things, and the word Jew is vastly absent, by and large, from their representation, and basically things go from bad to worse as we move closer and closer to toward the Soviet victory. Uh, with Silvinsky, the price was not only the agony of finding the right words, the agony of worrying about censorship becoming one's own censor. With Silvinsky, the price literally meant that he was punished. What happens with him is, so 42 is a very good year for him. He is fighting, he's a decorated military officer, he's nationally famous. And then in, when the tide of the war changes, and the tide of the war changes between Stalingrad and Kursk, so we're talking about s summer 1943, uh, that's when the tide of the war is changing. The Soviets begin to liber liberate large swaths of previously occupied territories. In that context, all of a sudden, in November 1943, Silvinsky is recalled to Moscow. His commanders, the generals, assume that he is being decorated. Silvinsky was summoned to Moscow. He was brought to appear at a meeting of the Secretariat of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. A number of key Soviet leaders were there, and Stalin himself made an appearance at the meeting, and uh, 
Silvinsky was uh, charged and he became the target of three separate party resolutions, including the most devastating one uh, of February 1944. He was charged with uh, uh, slandering the Russian people. And if you can imagine, contextually, euphemistically, this is the gravest of all charges with misrepresenting the war. And the punishment was twofold and particularly severe. He was uh, dismissed from the army demobilized. So uh, Lieutenant Colonel Silvinsky was no longer a military officer, no longer a journalist. He was a person of no status. He was also blacklisted. And he was forced to stay in Moscow. Why Silvinsky felt that the punishment was particularly uh, sardonically, uh, you know, uh, sophisticated was that he loved the warfare. He loved to be there where the action was. He loved to fight. He loved to witness. He felt that as a Jew, as a writer, as a Soviet, his mission was there where the fighting was taking place, and his mission was to be a witness. Instead, he was not under domestic arrest, but in a manner of speaking, he was in Moscow, and he stayed in Moscow from uh, the late fall of 1943 till April 1945. And I argue that basically this was not only a message to the uh, Soviet literary community not to transgress the boundaries of that which was allowed and expected, but also specifically when it comes to Silvinsky, a nationally famous poet and a nationally famous witness, he was removed from there where he would have done more witnessing and where he would have written more powerfully about the Holocaust, about the Shoah. So that was the punishment and the price, of course, he was prevented from writing and publishing and from doing more witnessing. There are other ways in which he was uh, punished and there are other prizes he paid, but that was, I think, the heaviest price. Up to the Second World War, or what is known in Russia as the Great Patriotic War, many Jewish poets were not allowed to publish and many were imprisoned or killed. How did Silvinsky manage to survive and publish in those years? The period following the victory over Nazism, uh, following a, a very brief initial uh, sort of, you know, victorious spring, uh, that period roughly starting from 1946 and until, especially 47, 48, and until Stalin's death in 1953 was probably the darkest period in the history of Soviet Jewry, particularly Jewish culture, where Jews were being uh, de-Jewified, repressed, and in some cases, uh, when it comes to leading Jewish uh, Yiddish poets, murdered by the Soviet state. In other words, not in, on the heels of the Holocaust, there was another onslaught now coming from uh, the Soviet leadership. Um, the, the period starts with an onslaught against uh, that which was deemed uh, cosmopolitan uh, and bourgeois nationalist, and Jews fit very well under both rubrics. It doesn't begin as an open onslaught against Jews, but with the steamrolling of the Black Book, which was a compendium of testimonies and materials about the Shoah in the Soviet Union, with the trial of the members of the anti-fascist committee, and a number of them were leading Jewish, uh, Yiddish poets. And with their execution, of course, they, this becomes an open, open uh, attack against Jewish culture and Jewish identity in the Soviet Union. In that context, Silvinsky's survival is both surprising and not. Well, he was not a poet in the Yiddish language. His tool was the Russian language, although he wrote very powerfully a number of times about Jewishness and about the Holocaust, especially as I discuss in the book. Uh, in the years 1948-49, he expected every night, and his wife uh, wrote about it later, I've spoken about this with his daughter, he expected uh, that he would be arrested, uh, and every night he and his wife would stay up, uh, you know, thinking that, you know, this is the night of his arrest. He was not arrested, however. Uh, he was targeted in various uh, party materials, in various speeches of Soviet leaders, uh, but he survived. Uh, what is 
also particularly important, although he is not an a he's not able to publish all of his works in those years uh, uh, of late post-war Stalinism, he does manage to uh, include some of these Holocaust poems in his uh, uh, books, se selected uh, works that appear in 47, then subsequently in the early 1950s. Uh, explanations vary. He was a major figure. He was a decorated war veteran. He uh, particularly was admired in the Soviet military. Uh, Silvinsky's family and Silvinsky's daughter, for instance, I've spoken to her at length about it, believe that he owed his survival to Stalin himself. Stalin had a very complicated relationship with a number of Soviet writers. He was very involved in literary politics. He said very famously and characteristically about Silvinsky that Silvinsky was a poet of genius, but he was far removed from the people. So he felt that he was a literary elitist, too much of an, uh, a figure with an aesthetic agenda. And yet, and yet, uh, Perhaps, uh, you know, Stalin's uh, partial patronage, as was also the case with Pasternak, for instance, very famously had something to do with Silvinsky's survival. I am not sure. I also argue here that uh, Silvinsky uh, wrote his way out of his wartime exile and punishment by writing several dithyrambic poems about Stalin, but he was not the, the only one. Poems about Stalin were expected of uh, all poets. And so I'm not convinced that that was the sole reason. But I think his connection to Stalin, Stalin's special opinion about Silvinsky, might have had something to do with his survival and with his uh, being able to remain in the Soviet mainstream through thick and thin. And that's very important because if you look carefully through the uh, books of Silvinsky's that appear in the 30s, 40s, 50s, you see time and again that he manages to include poems with Jewish content. And particularly in the post-war period, these Holocaust poems about Crimea, really they're in some ways his signature, his literary signature, his uh, signature as a citizen and as a Jew.